kind of weird. I kind of fell into this a little bit. Um, I used to work, well, I got into home construction in 2008. Funny time to get into it. And then I kind of, you know, I learned the ropes for a couple years and then I got hired on by a big clothing company as the design build manager. So I went around building retail locations, you know, around the country. And it was cool, but, you know, it was kind of a corporate job and I didn't really feel great about what I was doing. You know, that was not by any means an ethical fashion clothing company. Meaning, you know, they used a lot of sweat labor, slave labor, whatever you want to call it. So I always test fit because this glue is gnarly. The glue is awesome. It works really good. The PLX3, I believe is what's specced out by InstaFast. Yeah. So another thing that I always do on these window captures is I back cut your guys' groove. I cut it off because there's no way to put it on the tongue and groove assembly and then squeeze it under the window. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be like dead tight everywhere, really. Um, but yeah, it's kind of something I haven't seen before in like the into fast world, but I couldn't imagine how anybody would do it without back cutting the groove out. Um, so this fits pretty good. I'm happy with this, but if I chuck that full of spray foam, uh -huh. I'd be worried about, yeah, essentially moisture retention. Yeah. Um, and that's a huge issue in passive housing construction. Okay. You know, this is essentially part of my WRB, um, but I wouldn't rely on it solely. Having a drainage plane is a huge benefit of it so fast. And I actually don't think it's a good idea to ever dam it up. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you lose that much uh, thermal protection mm -hmm. by just back cutting that a little bit. Right, and then that. I'll glue it too, you'll see that, just so that it sticks in there. And so I kind of decided to go back to work for my old boss, the contractor that taught me everything. And he was getting some jobs, you know, in the sustainability sector. And one of his clients asked him if he would go take the builder certification with uh, Fias. Yeah. Um, and he was like, you should come too. And I was like, okay. So we flew off to Boston and took the course. And uh, I just got really, you know, fascinated by it. Um, and it kind of made it what I was sort of looking for, just some sort of spiritual fulfillment uh, in the trades and, you know, something I already like doing, but not just like flipping homes or, uh, you know, building stuff for clothes to sit on. Yeah. Um, like you're actually caring about what Yeah, and, and it turns out it's just like, it's fascinating, like yeah. how far the science has progressed. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine building homes, especially here in Tucson, Arizona, uh, less weatherized than what we're doing right now. It's going to get so hot. We're, we actually modeled this house uh, for Phoenix temperatures um, because it's going to get that hot within the next 15 years. Um, I just think it's wildly irresponsible to be flipping homes in Tucson, Arizona, when we know the energy costs are going to soar. I mean, we talk about like uh, we talk about solar a lot, we talk about electric cars a lot, but really a huge dent that we could make is weatherizing buildings. And you could build that into the legislation and the building code, you know, if you had the desire and the money to do so. I wouldn't say there's a rush because I don't think there's an incentive, you know, like uh, there's a long-term energy savings, mm -hmm. you know, but um, who that should really matter to is government subsidized housing. So mm -hmm. I kind of feel like we have two huge problems in the country and I see it here in Tucson. It's pretty bad here. We have a housing crisis uh, with lots of people on the streets mm -hmm. um, and we have a climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So something, you know, our local state and federal government could do is incentivize builders to build for climate change and do that financially. 
uh, rebates. I um, mean, some people do to an extent, mm -hmm. you know, but not enough to push these builders to really be jumping at those jobs and to re-educate their workforce, mm -hmm. which would also be very necessary. DPHC would be able to, you know, better explain, but I think initial upfront cost is 10 to 20 percent higher than standard construction, mm -hmm. but over 20 years, uh, the savings more than offsets that. You know, the energy savings. This house will use um, about 80 percent less energy than a standard home in Tucson. And we have solar generation, so by the time we're done, hopefully if we get certified passive and source zero, this house will create all the energy that it uses. And, you know, we'll pull off the grid at night, of course, but we'll be paying that back in the daytime. Um, but I really do think that's the answer. It's not about creating more energy, even if it's clean energy, it's about needing less energy. Need, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you only get, when you get to remodel a house once every 20 years or so, and I just think it's wildly irresponsible to not be taking these steps on every house yeah. that we build right now. Right. Because 20 years from now, you know, the next house down the street that just gets flipped is gonna have just a huge energy cost. Uh, and you know, this is a pretty low income neighborhood. Like, that's not fair to the people paying those costs. And I mean, there are parts of Tucson, you know, there's a lot of, heat-related death every summer. Uh, it does totally happen. People are just cooking in their homes, deciding whether or not to pay, you know, for food, medication, or the air conditioning. Uh, so, you know, this is something we could do to just make things better for our community. Yeah. From uh, the certification process, you know, like, obviously they can't ding you for not insulating under a slab on a retrofit. Six and a half. What do you hate? Worst spot it could be in. And go six and a half the whole way. That's easy. So this is uh, the piece of the panel that I have to cut off to squeeze under a window because um, you just can't force it in and, and, and make the turn to get in there. So I figured it out. Uh, I get my settings just dialed in and I can go really fast on the table saw. Height, one and a half inches. And then fence is seven sixteenths to the inside of the blade. There. And if I did it right, this should just shoot right out the back. So that gives me like a super clean cut. So instead of a dado, it's now a rabbit and it can just slide right in. Um, and it's just something I found works really good on the table saw. I go kind of heavy just because I don't want any issues later down the road. And then I, when I do cut, back of the groove off, I always glue the side that will touch. Even after cement board goes on, I'll have another detail of aluminum flashing that wraps around the whole interior of the window. Um, and also, uh, spray foam is helpful here and there, but I don't think it's rated anywhere close to the uh, EPS that InsoFast is made out of. 
you know, it's much more porous just due to the nature of its application. So I try to stay away from using spray foam as a fix on Instafast. I think it uh, it's better to just figure out how to get as tight as you possibly can everywhere. Where the Insta Fast just kind of has to bend. <laughs> 